That's an old German adage, really? It is, yeah. If, 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 if we don't have it, you don't need it. Yeah, we have everything you need. <laughs> what, what we don't have, you don't need. I love it. <laughs> well, cut, cut, cut. Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast. In this show, we talk about our experiences and lessons learned in enterprise architecture and business process management. What's Your Baseline is designed to be for everyone. Newbies who are just getting started with these topics, organizations who want to improve their EA and BPM groups and the value they get from it, as well as practitioners who want to get a different perspective and care about the discipline. Each episode will tackle different key topics, providing context, background, best practices, and stories from the road, inviting you to learn from our challenges and successes, and demonstrating key tools to help you set up your practice and get the most out of it. I'm your host, Roland Wolt, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., on this wonderful sunny day, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Ready to rock, as we say. <laughs> That's great, because the topic of the day is to talk about how to get set up, which tools you use and uh, which functionalities you need to set up your enterprise architecture and process management platform. Yeah, this is a it's a huge topic for a lot of organizations trying to figure out exactly what to buy, how to buy, how to introduce these things, what decision criteria you're going to use. And well, there's a lot to it. So we're here to help you give you a couple of tips and tricks on how you might do that and direct you to some resources you might be able to use on, of course, our companion blog, What's your baseline.com? Isn't that a good plug, Roland? <laughs> that is an awesome pitch. I like that. So let's get started. So, JM, what do you typically see as quote unquote architecture tools in the market? That's a great question. Well, there's a lot of different flavors of how people perceive architecture tools. Uh, some of people think of them as just the drawing tools. What do I put, you know, pen to paper with uh, and make visualizations so I can understand my business and architecture a little better and communicate it to everyone else. Um, people think of it as like the, the, the front end interface that you're using. So like literally the, the diagramming platform or the modeling platform or the data entry platform. Um, they also think of it as the back end. Um, what am I containing all this business process and enterprise architecture information in? So what kinds of databases am I using? Am I connecting information together in a relational fashion? Uh, all those sorts of things. And that all that together becomes your architecture platform. So a drawing tool, uh, uh, an interface for all your users, and a container for all of your information. Uh, but, but you can conceive of things in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, and Roland, you know, tell me a little bit about how you see this and, and particularly particularly how you see the idea of visualization versus data. Yeah, so, so I see the, the structure, even though I would use the same words that you did a little bit differently. So when I look in the market, I, I really find a lot of drawing tools. It's the Visio that's on everybody's computer, mm -hmm. right? Because it's free. So what you get is a piece of virtual canvas and you can put in symbols, boxes and arrows on it. But the, the drawback is, that it's just boxes and arrows. So there's no method behind it, even though in, in Visio you might have a stencil that says BPMN, you know, you have the different shapes, but there's no enforcement mm -hmm. of these shapes. You know, what does it mean? Is, is my triangle your rounded rectangle or somebody else's circle? And that's, that's more drawing to it, so I don't want to dig on Visio all the time. Yeah. And I think we're actually going to talk about that a little bit in a notations episode to come. So for our, our lovely listeners, uh, get ready for a future episode talking you through how you might represent information. That is true. So the second class of tools that I see are front ends of implementation systems. So think about Biz Agile as a uh, business process management system, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or think about the, the SAF AG designer as the front end of the web methods runtime platform. Mm -hmm. Those um, are typically database. They have a method being built in, but they have a different focus. They capture only that what is interesting for the automation aspect. So for mm -hmm. example, you can draw a process in that tool, but you cannot create data models or you cannot create application landscapes or whatever is outside of the scope of the tool. Yeah, and I see a lot of organizations kind of falling into, not the trap, but rather that sort of fixing it in the mix by having this kind of tool established, but you know, really not having any ability to scale it to the enterprise. It's only ever really meant for the thing that it does, which is supporting the automations in the platform that it's talking to. Yep, yep, Blue works. <clears throat> 
for example. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not, not, not that we're here to crap on different types of types of <laughs> platforms, just to say these are concerns that you should have when choosing to implement a tool and making the choice is very important. Don't just slip into whatever is convenient. Make a good choice for your organization. This is about growing and expanding um, as a company into a business process and enterprise architecture practice. Yeah, and then the, the third class of tools that I see is then database-driven tools. Mm -hmm. So these are tools like Softwares, Ares, Megas, Hopex, uh, Biz Designs tool. So those are tools that uh, use the power of a database, a relational database in the backend to have an object-oriented approach to things. So for example, if you have an object, you can reuse it multiple times in your models. If you now figure out you have a typo in there, you just change it once and it will be changed in a dozen other models where you use that object. While in Visio, if you figure out you have a typo, guess what? You have to figure out where do I use this shape and then open dozens of Visio models and do it over and over again, right? That fix that you want. So that is obviously a uh, time-saving thing. The other benefit of it is you have relations in there you can report on, and, and we will talk about all those functionalities that you would see in that class of tools a little bit later in this show. That's a good way to start with things. Um, and I, I think we, we also want to talk about um, how people see information and you know I, I I like to group things into two categories really they're they're kind of one thing flipped on its head which is data driven visualizations versus visualization driven data mm -hmm. uh, so when you think about you know types of architecture tools uh, let's start with the easy one visualization driven data um, those are the, those are the tools where you put a model or you create a visualization in order to represent your business and in doing so it captures and supports a sort of structure data layer underneath that that's representative of what you show in the page. Uh, what that does is it means that you're creating rich data structures, making rich connections, being able to report and understand, but you're doing it from the perspective of sort of flow charting, visual modeling, uh, structural modeling, easy kind of things you can get your, you know, get your hands dirty without having to get some much experience or know that data structure at a detailed level. The opposite, of course, being data-driven visualization tools, as in you create a set of data, and that could be a hierarchy that you're bringing in yourself or uh, creating from uh, an, an import from another source or however you wish to, and it renders that information in a format that you can understand and communicate. Um, we, we see that a lot more in things like uh, IT structures um, and tools like Alphabet um, by Software AG, where it's about creating automatic visualizations based off of the underlying content of data. And that's very handy, um, but you know, you just own strengths and weaknesses, which we'll get into in a little while. But I do see those as sort of, you know, one turned on the head of the other, and they're both relevant and important for the relative groups. For instance, the lowest barrier to entry is always winner when it comes to the business. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's also important to be able to understand what you're buying when you're looking at making a tool selection. Agreed. And it depends on your potential audience. You know, business people typically like diagrams, IT people like tables. Um, and when I look into the market, there's a couple of tools mentioning, for example, Megas Hopex, which brings everything into one tool. Um, there are other tools that have separate tools that synchronize with each other. But either way, the challenge will be to identify who is your audience that you're, you're going to try to sell a tool to, right? Mm -hmm. And what do they prefer? So like in any architectural project, have a look at your stakeholders and see what their needs and their wishes and their objectives are and how you can um, support this. Yeah, and, and obviously we're going to talk about that when we talk about readiness for a platform. But just to introduce this idea, the people you have, the team you have, they're your most valuable resource. You know, the old adage, a fool with a tool, still a fool. And you want to have the right people in place to be able to leverage whatever platform you choose and be able to put it into a practice you can do repeatedly and scale and grow and sustain as your organization adopts it. The other thing we want to talk about is the focus of different architecture tools. Now, Roland, what, you know, you've seen uh, different types of architecture tools with specializations. Um, these are sort of the niche players um, that come into this is the this is the one thing they do really well. Um, but you know, how, what sort of flavors have you seen of this architecture tool represented by smaller or more niche kind of vendors? Well, it depends on on how you define niche. You know, there's obviously tools like a Sparks that is a UML and BPMN modeler. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you have a small vendor like Adonis, 
with their tool, which I thought the first time I read it, oh, these are some old RDS Shear colleagues from way back when who <laughs> wrote this. When I looked through the method model, and yeah. the method manual and, and the visualization, it was just like other colors. So uh, different things for different purposes. I think there's a couple of tools that are big and we will talk about when we say, okay, uh, how do they interact with others? But at the end of the day, what you need to think about is what is the focus that you look mm -hmm. at? Do you want to do more business architecture? So modeling processes, capabilities, orgs, these type of things. Uh, do you look for a specific custom experience um, mm -hmm. modeling? Or do you look more for risk and controls or data or applications or technology? And I think this is, when you look at your stakeholders, this is what will determine what the flavor of the tool will be. And I hope it, it became clear it should be a database-driven tool. So yeah. forget the other three, two classes. <laughs> it's, it's one of those. But then it's it comes to a couple of other criteria that we'll talk in a second. Yeah. And so, you know, thinking about these things, whether or not you're looking at a, a tool that's focused on one of these avenues, so the process capabilities, experience, architecture, risk, data, technologies, those sorts of things, um, whether you're taking a look at modeling tools that are, are data driven or visualization driven, whether you're talking about drawing tools, front end database tools. Our question for you today to start us off on this journey is, what are you doing right now? Think about in your organization and your team, even yourself, what, what kind of experience do you have? What, what tools have you seen? Um, are they working for you? And if you could you know, have your druthers, as they say, what would you love in a future state of any platform? Just as a, concept, a conceptual idea, what, what kinds of things drive you to feel like, yeah, this would make my organization and my role even stronger? We'll leave you for a moment and come back with our answers. Ah, and hopefully you've had a chance to think about what you're doing today. <laughs> I remember the first time uh, I had a chance to think about that. I was working uh, with a education supplier and trying to figure out how I could model their buying process. They were using a, a pretty major buying platform. And all we did was throw it on the wall with sticky notes <laughs> and with whiteboard markers. And the first time I got introduced to a database driven tool, I, man, my heart just soared. I thought, wow, this is a way we could actually connect all this information in. And of course, somebody else had done that tool selection for me, uh, and which, which meant that I got to have an easier job because of the thought that went into it. And today we're going to look at that in this section. What kind of thought do you need to go into when making this tool selection? And we're going to cover five different topics. Um, the first thing is what do you need to get started? How do we get started with selecting the right platform for you? And um, then second, of course, what to look for when choosing that tool. Um, third, we're gonna dig into some functional criteria you might be looking for, things you should be evaluating. On um, the fourth, we're gonna talk a little bit through deployment and cost considerations. I know that a lot of organizations are very cost sensitive, not a problem. Um, we can help you get the, the most out of your dollar. And then lastly, talk about the people. As I said at the beginning, you know, the people are the most important. How does this decision align with your team. So Roland, why don't you, know, you get you get us started with how do we get started? <laughs> yeah, that's obviously the first question. I, I think you obviously need some equipment and I'm not talking about servers right now. I'm just talking about your personal setup. Mm -hmm. um, first thing is you need a computer. That sounds super strange, but obviously you need to access it. You need a computer. And well, in the end, it doesn't matter which type of computer you have, if it's a Windows computer or a Macintosh or even a Chromebook, which is more than sufficient with modern systems. The more important thing that you want to look at is buy a big monitor. The bigger, the better. All right, so look at whatever, a 4K, 5K monitor so that they have enough room to create big diagrams. Mm -hmm. Nothing is more confusing if you have to scroll sideways upwards, downwards, and so on and so forth, zoom in, zoom out to get your model over the point. The next thing that you need is 
in some form or fashion an office program because those database driven tools that we just spoke about they spit out reports you want to see them so it doesn't have to be microsoft office it could be LibreOffice or your office program of choice as long as it can open the microsoft file formats mm -hmm. the next thing that i would recommend is uh, obviously some ergonomic setup have a comfy chair you will spend a lot of time in your chair have a good desk maybe one that you even can raise and stand uh, on <laughs> Um, and and make yourself comfortable. Are you a standing desk man, Roland? Is that is that what you are? <laughs> you love that? No, I've never tried it. So, no, I'm sitting on. Well, I like to walk around when taking phone calls. Oh, but I'm not working on on this. The other thing is, you might also think about having like a little chair with a coffee table, because you will read a lot of documents, and you might not want to read this on your desktop. Mm -hmm. So have a little coffee corner where you do this. And speaking of which, I also would recommend to have a tablet for this. And it can be a cheap tablet like an Amazon Fire or something like that. You don't have to buy the high spec iPad or whatever the Samsung equivalent of it is. You just want to have the opportunity to have a second monitor that you can access the internet with that you can have, for example, a diagram of your legacy tool being there while you model on your computer that has the big screen attached and you don't have to switch between applications. Hmm. To make that easier for you, um, I have assembled a list of items that I use and I posted that on whatsyourbaseline.com. So you can have a look at, at these things that I'm personally using. Yeah, and I, and I know that you know personally having a large monitor available, particularly when you're working with you know, process models that have a lot of objects on them, you're going to want to be able to see the whole picture and then zoom into what matters. That's that's a really good piece of advice, and hopefully you'll check out that equipment list too. The other thing, thing Roland, is you know, besides the, the physical stuff, um, there's one thing I wanted to make sure you, you talked about is that you do also have information. Mm -hmm. So as you are preparing to, to introduce something like this into your own personal workflow, make sure you've captured information you might have from existing documentation or you've got you know, subject matter experts ready to facilitate you know, interviews with to help get information into it. So you're getting the physical information, phys physical gear and you're getting the digital information ready to go. So when you're ready and you've got something installed, you're able to stand up a real repository right away. Fully agreed. Fully agreed with that statement. And talking about repositories, you know, where do you put those? Are, are we looking at this on like a, a, on your desktop or how, where should we be looking for an implementation for this to go? So now comes the, the hot part and uh, every tool vendor will obviously tell you, oh, what we have is... Uh, exactly what you need. One stop shop, just buy from us. The reality is a little bit different. So typically you want to look for different functionality and maybe a vendor has all that functionality built in. But what I see is at least four big topics that you want to have a look at. One is you need that modeling capability. You need to be able to create the artifacts and manage the artifacts and all these things that one would expect an architecture tool does. The second big feature that you want to look at is dashboards. Can you create something that's easily digestible for your higher level, C-level stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Because I can promise you none of those guys will ever go into your repository and drill down on the nth level and open that diagram that you just spent three days uh, creating. The third one that I would look at is something like a wiki. So think about a confluence, think about Notion or, or any of those wikis, because you will have to create um, some documents at some point in time when you follow Toga, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very document focused, which I think is a little bit outdated. But on the other side, if you use a wiki, guess what? It's online. You can do changes there. It's accessible by multiple people. You don't look for different versions of a word file and whatnot. Just as a, as a note for you, you know, while you can do things with just a wiki, we're also just talking about it as a, as a collaboration platform. You know, that includes document management and knowledge management, mm -hmm. which means you're wanting to have some sort of interactivity and some capacity to post, uh, be notified, and ultimately respond and engage with the, with the platform you're working on, right? 
or, or even just coordinating. So, for example, we use Notion here in our podcast mm. to just put in our episodes and having little pages that have the outline of the topics that we want to talk about. <laughs> it's easy to transfer this into a setup where you have to shepherd a bunch of architects, a bunch of modelers to, to whatever, say, import a batch of existing models into uh, your architecture mm -hmm. tool. And that the last thing that you want to have a look at is um, tools that help you to, say, record input. So what I'm talking about are things like process mining tools where you take data from your runtime systems and you uh, put it in a process mining tool and it creates the as-is process. What actually is going on versus what you might have seen heard in a workshop with your SMEs, because that's obviously a limited audience. The point is, get some data insights that you can use as an accelerator or as a starting point for your architecture development. I think we'll have a whole episode focused on process mining or a couple episodes even. Um, that's a, certainly a part of how organizations get their as is and continuously monitor um, how the deployment of processes is going. So that's a really good feature to have. Um, but I wanted to hone in on the actual functional criteria. We've talked at a high level of the things you should be looking for. Let's talk about the third point here. You know, what stuff am I evaluating the quality of the pitches that are presented to me based off of? Um, and I think the first thing I, I think about when I think about you know modeling tools, architecture tools, you know, our database-driven tools, even though that there's a lot of power behind them. The first thing's got to be the user interface. Uh, what's the look and feel of how it is to work in this platform? Mm -hmm. and you're, you're looking at something that's going to be your day to day. What's the day in the life of a modeler? What's the day in the life of a viewer? What's the day in the life of somebody who's doing architecture and controlling this? And that user interface is going to be the you know, really the controller of everyone's willingness to work in this. Because if it's too hard, they're going to walk away. So how does it how does it work? And that also includes the management of different databases or folders within the database. Mm -hmm. Your structure. Yeah, so that people don't have to hunt for content, but it's easily structured or it's, it's easily understandable for a modeler or a stakeholder to go in the database and say, yep, this is where I find it. And I've seen, unfortunately, independent of the tool, I've seen a lot of implementation where people were just lost in getting their, their content structured right. Yeah. It helps you to find things, helps you to contextualize things. So you want an organization within the tool that brings things together. Uh, and that that's going to be important uh, and something that's accessible in that fashion. Um, the second thing I, I always look for, and you talked about it a little bit before, Roland, is, is different perspectives based off of different types of users and their needs. And the biggest one is, of course, dashboards for management. Does it have the capacity to evaluate its own data? So dashboards focused internally. And does it have the capacity to hybridize that or look at external data? Perfect example of a, of a use case for that is a customer experience management tool that allows you to bring in NPS. So, so your net, net promoter score from however people are evaluating your processes gets hybridized with the actual models you're designing about how your customer journey is going. That's important. And that gives you a lot of insights on where to go next, what to do, and how to improve. Uh, we, we also want to look at the workflow around the control of the environment. So are you able to allocate and manage tasks for different users? You know, this could become a very cumbersome process to create a modeling system that is everyone's manual task to go and figure out, hey, what do I have to do next? Well, if you can prompt them, it's a lot easier. And I think this is a success criteria for the tool, because when you think about your different stakeholders, yeah. say you have a approval process and you have different stakeholders there, the owner of the model, uh, your risk folks, the SOX folks who need to sign off on it. Uh, you have the technical QA people who want to check your model if it's correctly modeled according to your standards and so on and so forth. I doubt that you get the owner and the risk people to say, oh yeah, it's easily found on the seventh level in your structure in the <laughs> database. Nope. So what you want is you want to have a workflow functionality where you can create custom GUIs and you can do the routing of uh, the messages so people get email notifications and they see a screen that's quote unquote designed just for them and mm -hmm. it gives them exactly those features that you need to accomplish that task. Things like click here to open the model 
click here to enter your comments. Uh, click here to do a comparison between this version of the model and the one that you approved six months ago. Mm -hmm. Right. So make it easy for your for your end users, your stakeholders who play a role in those processes. And another thing that you might want to think about is when you remember the last episode that you heard about how to implement your architecture tool is the process governance part. Mm -hmm. Map out your processes and see what you ask your stakeholders and your roles to do. And then once you've done that and you've socialized it, take a step back and think about what can you automate with your workflow tool to make it easier for the people to play a role in those processes. Yeah. I, I, another thing that I think goes along with what you said a couple of seconds ago um, is, a, is a configurability. That's a functional criteria for a lot of the platforms that I'm evaluating. Can you make it look the way you need to make it look? Um, and that comes in a couple of different ways, one of which we'll speak about very shortly. But really, the most technical way of looking at this is, can you change the face of the tool? And how do you change it? Is it a business user configuration? Is it very difficult to do? And can you make it tailored for user perspectives? That'll make it, once again, easier to get into, and most importantly, right for you. Yeah, that brings us to a second point. Obviously, changing a portal, changing the landing page that a user comes to when he opens the tool, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing in the background is obviously, what is the method that's built in? So how can I change the architecture views, the model types, the object types, all these type of things. Does that tool have a flexible meta model, which then gives me the capability to put a reporting on top of it that gives me exactly that information that I was asking for. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I look at that meta model, and we spoke about briefly also in the last episode, it obviously then becomes critical that your tool also has some scripting capabilities so that you can, for example, create interfaces to other systems. Say you want to bring in an application landscape that's hosted in your CMDB, like a ServiceNow, for example. Mm -hmm. Obviously, your idea is to go and get the information from the source of truth and not make up an application landscape in your architecture tool. Yeah. To do this, you need to be able to create an interface between the CMDB and uh, your architecture tool. So the question is, does it exist out of the box because the vendor did a good job and was thinking about this um, and it was feasible to do commercially? Or do you have to do this by yourself? So a good tool, in my opinion, would have an integrated development environment that where you can do the development, the debugging, the testing, all these type of things, and also has an API, a well-documented API, where you see which functions are available and what can be done. Mm -hmm. And while doing this, ideally, the programming language is nothing that's tool specific. Some vendors do this, some don't, but it's more a standard programming language like JavaScript, for example, yeah. to create those reports, because that obviously opens the um, potential pool of candidates for a developer role significantly. Yeah, also, you're, you're not going to end up having to pay that vendor for the consulting services all the time to, to make, maintain your tool. You'll be able to bring it in house, maybe use existing talent and ultimately be able to better support yourself at a lower cost. Agreed. Agreed. And then when you look at this, now we're speaking about developer types, you also might want to have a look at um, the more advanced end users slash the power users. What type of analysis do you give them uh, at hand? That obviously could be a report that was created by your developers or prepackaged with the tool. But it's also interesting to see, does your tool have a easy to use query language? Or can you create a report as a power user without whatever having to learn a full blown programming language, but you have like a wizard that helps you doing this? Or can you as a power user create those dashboards, those process mining analysis uh, visually without having to go into code? Mm -hmm. So those would be also things not only think about when, when we talk about scripting, not only thinking about the developer type of person, but also think about the power users or the end users who just want to have a visualization of what they found. 
Yeah, it also means you can decentralize a lot of the control and management of the environment. You don't have to have just a specialized team. You can release it to your business units who are eager to get to work. And if you give them what they need, then ultimately you can give them a lot of power to make a change with the platform without having to go back to you every time. And they'll feel more involved. Ultimately, they'll do more. And having said that, you obviously should have multiple environments where you do this. So I see one mistake that clients do is they buy one instance of their modeling tool and think everything is fine. In all reality, if you build some complex scripts, like interfaces, for example, you do not want to build this in production. Yeah. You want to set it up like any other IT project and have a dev environment and a test environment mm -hmm. and a production environment. And only if your test is successful and the script does what it's supposed to do and remember every software has box yeah only then you bring it into production and you think about what happens if in production your script fails how do you mitigate that destruction or, or hopefully not destruction that <laughs> oh uh, impact yes. that this might have on your database right or on your production environment mm -hmm. so think about from a governance perspective what do you allow end users power users and developers to do and that should be obviously part of your process governance that you've defined uh, as part of your implementation approach. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I also, you touched briefly about integration capabilities, um, but you know, and you, you talk about RESTful APIs or other types of, of intersections of, of data. I mean, you also want to think of this just as a conceptual item, as the connective tissue of your organization, right? You, you want to see it as the hub and the spokes being all the different sources of truth, these sort of golden standards of data feeding into it. The ease and the, and the frequency and the, and the ability to do in data interchange that goes along with that is really important to consider in making the decision. Uh, because if it's hard to do, or it's asynchronous, or there's chances of data getting lost, or the, or the, the you know, it's not a bi-directional interface, um, if those platforms aren't able to do that, then you could lose a lot and have to do a lot of rework uh, as a result of data not coming over. Agreed. But one misconception that I also see is where people look at it and say, oh, yeah, it must be real time. <laughs> this is typically on the on the list of criteria for an interface. The last one that I see, because architecture tools are not runtime systems. No. So in, in all honesty, it doesn't matter if you import or update your uh, application inventory to stick with that example once a week. Yeah. Right? And not in real time, because at the end of the day, you're creating designs, right? And if, if you model and then you figure out, oh, there's something missing, well, there's enough time to call your CMDB folks and say, hey, I'm missing that application and they fix it. And then with the next batch update uh, within a week, you get that object. So typically it's not that time critical. And I would put this... Um, very low on the list. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the, one of the highest item on the list for interfaces in my mind is being open to as many formats as possible. Mm. So if you create your dashboard, you want to be able to add maps, for example. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to grab an XML or RSS feed from somewhere and embed it in your dashboard. Yeah. It doesn't matter how often you use it, but your tool should have those technical capabilities there. And I would choose this over real-time integration at any point in time. Well, I, I, I agree. Um, and, and speaking about you know, choosing things, I, I wanted to touch a little bit about in our next topic uh, about cost and deployment, um, because those are obviously important important things to consider when you're looking to make a purchase or when you're looking to evaluate a platform. We talked a little bit before about the idea of on-premise versus uh, versus cloud, but you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of pricing models that organizations will go into, vendors will go into on how they sell their platforms. Um, some will have, offer you something like a SaaS model of per user, per year. Um, some will have a base cost for how much it costs to just run that server. So particularly if you're looking at a SaaS 
hosted solution for you. Um, they're going to have that that base cost built into it, um, plus those user costs. Um, whether or not you're doing a subscription model, uh, as in you're deploying it on premise, but you're paying a yearly subscription fee or a perpetual licensing model. Um, and remember, you also need to take into consideration if you're deciding to deploy it on premise, your internal hosting costs and the timelines associated with uh, servers. I was talking to a client uh, a few weeks ago, and they said, "Listen, if, I, if we want to get an internal service uh, or a server for our, our deployment, we're looking at a six-month wait time to grab that." And he said, "It's not it's not uncommon in in, in that company uh, to wait six months to get a little internal instance." And so he said, "You know, listen, if we're going to deploy on premise, I'm not going to see the benefits even even after purchase mm -hmm. for at least six months. That's crazy." Um, so you know, going to SaaS as an option for that makes it a little easier. So thinking about that deployment consideration. And, and it's also the scalability, as you said, how fast can I add new people to yeah. this? Or when you think about the process mining example, typically the billing there is slightly different, not by user, even though that also might play a role. But typically the driving factor is how many cases do you want to push through the process mining system? And the different tiers of number of cases that are that are in the different price plans. Yeah. One thing that I notice overall, and maybe the old guys like you and I will have to take a step back from what we've seen in the past. I think uh, the on-prem hosting is on its way out. I think organizations have accepted cloud. Um, the other thing what goes out of the door is perpetual licensing. Mm -hmm. It's just subscriptions because it's so much easier. You have it in your OPEX budget and it's just a run-through cost that an organization has to carry. So when you look and you go shopping for your systems, be comfortable with cloud and be comfortable with subscription. I wish more of the folks I talked to were, were comfortable with that idea and with that approach. But I, I do know that some organizations have a pretty hard and fast can't be on cloud and for you know data privacy considerations. I know a couple of governmental organizations and a couple of major financial institutions that mm -hmm. simply won't let things out the door. That is that isn't the way it's going to work. And I get that. Yep. And it will be harder for them going forward. Oh yeah, and to deploy on 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 places, the you know, last couple things to think about um, is what types of users are you looking at bringing in? Um, how many of each of those? And so, generally, uh, vendors tend to price things based off of people who are looking at stuff, and people who are making stuff, and people who are controlling stuff. That's sort of three bucketed categories. Now they might spice it up with different types of names or different you know breakdowns of what they can do in each and functional decomposition. It really comes down to those those sort of three ideas. So the the the, the looky lose the makers and the controllers and how many of those are on your team what does it look like um, and how much does each cost you, you don't want to get caught up in a, a surprise when you're ending up buying all of the most expensive license rather than sort of splitting them in a way that makes sense for the organization and that, that also goes with the functionality modules note that a lot of organizations tend to split um, their product based off of what it can do for you. So for instance, you might not get process mining, you might just get modeling, you might not get, you know, uh, simulation, you might not get integrations and APIs for the same one price, it would you know, it has a sort of different modularized buildup of what the final product is going to be. So make sure you carefully consider your use cases today, your use cases in the near term and your use cases in the long term, and scale out a deployment for those companies and get a real price based off how much you're going to be paying each year based off what you need. Um, that's both the users and also in modularized priced out functionality. Does that make sense? It does. And at the end, it's it's also a negotiation mm -hmm. tactic to say, hey, I might buy tool A that doesn't have feature Y, say process mining. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, hey, if I buy your tool, I see you're working with a partner, uh, another firm, uh, that provides the process mining capability that I want. Well, your competition gives everything in one hand, right? They have the modeling aspect, they have the process mining aspect in one thing. So now you can start negotiating and mm -hmm. say, this is obviously a disadvantage if I have to bring in a third party to the party. Can, you, can we talk about the rates that you charge me? Yeah, that, that's a good one. Versus you could go to the to the other vendor who gives everything out of one hand and say, hey, yeah, but I could get it more cheaper if I split it and I'm willing to take the potential friction that comes here. But if I take yours, your deal will be bigger. But obviously, it would be great if you could accommodate our specific needs cost wise. Have a look at this and 
become clear about if you want to have everything from one vendor in one hand and you sell your soul a little bit to that vendor or if you want to <laughs> get the best of breed approach. And then you obviously have the disadvantage that you have to deal with multiple people and eventually with integration problems. Yeah, that's something that we see a lot of organizations think you know think they can get away with, which is buying niche tools, buy a buy you know six or seven niche tools, each one doing its tiny little thing, and try and Frankenstein them together. That can work in certain in certain circumstances where you have very divided business groups that are doing very different things and are totally isolated, and they just need occasionally to let each other know what's going on. But the truth is, you really do want an integrated environment. You really do, um, and the best way to do that is to go is to minimize the number of vendors. That's an enterprise architecture principle as well, sort of consolidation and harmonization and rationalization of architecture, right? Uh, you want to do the same thing with the tool set you're trying to get, get the rest of the organization to follow suit with, right? Uh, makes a lot of sense. I agree. Just again, think about the big blocks yeah. that you want to look at. You want to have the modeling capability. Uh, you want to have the dashboarding capability. You want to have the wiki capability. And you want to have the data ingestion capability, just like a process mining tool or other interfaces that we spoke about. And and if you can find a vendor that gives you all four, awesome. Ooh. Um, but try to, if not, try to limit to a manageable number. Because remember, your focus is on creating the architecture artifacts. It's not managing technology. It's not managing the vendor, yeah. looking at roadmaps and the promises that you hear. Yeah, that's truth. And the last piece of the puzzle I wanted to touch on is alignment with team. You know, um, Roland and I, you know, we've had a lot of opportunity to talk to people. As much as, you know, there are clients and there is there are, you know, sale of software, it is people at the end of the day who have to work on that software day in and day out. And you want to make sure you're making a purchase that aligns with the people you have and the people you're going to have. Um, so what skill sets and backgrounds do you have on your team? Are these people modelers? Have they done modeling in the past? Do they have expertise in business process analysis? Um, are they architects? Architects? Do they know structures of enterprise architecture? Do they understand the way in which the organization decomposes? How have they historically used platforms to do this? So knowing what their background and skill sets are means you're not buying a platform that they're not going to be capable of using or buying, buying something that they're not going to want because it isn't capable of meeting their expectations. You also want to understand your size and composition of team. How many people do you have in those roles I talked about before, the, the look you lose, the viewers, your, your doers, your creators, um, and your architects or controllers. How many people are architects? How many people are BAs? How many people do you have in QA? What sort of size of team are you looking at? Because a lot of these platforms aren't going to be able to accommodate larger teams, or maybe they're designed specifically for very large organizations. And you know you need to, for if you're a small team, maybe they're a little bit of an overkill. So seeing who and what you have have. Also understanding how much these are, need to be digital collaboration tools. So if you've got you know a, a very divided team across the geographies, you want to make sure that the virtual collaboration really brings people together. What, what you, you know what Roland was talking about before about this notion, this wiki, this collaboration, this document management together uh, needs to happen even stronger. Whereas you have a lot of geographic co-location, you're in one office, you're one team put together, you can go into a single room. You might need a little bit of a different tool, something where facilitated sessions are much more easily easily captured. Uh, in person. Uh, so, you know, something with big whiteboards and things like that. But is it still a question? You know, after 2020 and the coronavirus situation, <laughs> I think everybody's virtual. So when you look for a tool, what you want to look for is a central repository where people can access this from different locations, where the different roles can create their different artifacts in different areas. And basically, those are the deliverables that are that you expect your roles to do mm -hmm. and obviously what you want to have handy as well is some collaboration platform like a microsoft teams like a google meet you know where you can do screen sharing and you literally look at the same screen even though you're in different locations you're talking about things you want to have. I want to put it back to the audience here. And you know, folks are listening in, thinking about, oh, these are, a lot, these are a lot of things to think about, a lot of features. Which ones matter to me? Well, 
Uh, think about it in the next little while uh, as we take a quick break. What capabilities and features do you think are valuable? Things we've spoken about and maybe things we haven't spoken about. And this is a good opportunity to talk about you know, sending us feedback. This is something you might want to take after the show and put to us through an email or through a voice message on any of your lovely podcasting platforms. We'd love to hear from you. But we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be thinking about that too. Welcome back. Well, we spoke a lot about the functionality, the features, the capabilities that tools should have in the last section. There's another thing that you might want to think about, which is all the non-functional requirements around your tool. Mm -hmm. So JM, talk to me a little bit about what are the typical areas that you want to look at and non-functional decision criteria. I think about things like, tell me about the vendor. Um, I want to understand the vendor history, their future. Uh, what kind of support can I expect with this? Uh, what kind of what kind of uh, people uh, am I am I looking at to help me get my product to work in case something goes wrong? Uh, what kind of ecosystem? What kind of user community am I looking at? Uh, the acceptance in my organization. What's going to make me successful and my organization successful using this platform? And how will I embed it into my way of working? And then lastly. What's the business case I can create for this selection? Because ultimately, I need to prove and justify that we should make this selection and make a purchase of a tool. So Roland, tell me a little bit more about what, what do you care about when you think about the vendor and their profile? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, obviously, you want to have a vendor that is stable. Mm -hmm. So questions would be, how long has this company existed? Right? Are the products that they built built in-house? Or have they acquired technology from somebody else through an acquisition, right? Yeah. And how long, if they've done this, how long is that ago? So think about, is it more like, are they a reseller of something that they actually do not support or, or own or develop? Or is it grown for years and years and years in their house and has shown market viability? Mm -hmm. The other question that I would have is, how frequent do I get updates? from a product. I think nowadays it's completely not acceptable to wait months and years to get a new update, right? And we will talk in a future episode about agile and scaled agile and how that affects architecture. But I think nowadays you would expect frequent updates of your product yeah. every three months, for example, right? So look at when was the last update? What major release version are they on? Do they have intermediate updates, security updates, feature updates, and, and whatnot in between? That also leads to what is the vendor's product roadmap? How long do they plan their roadmap? Right? Is it really just the next iteration, three months? Or do they have a plan that stretches a year, two, three, five, and you can see where the, the ship is going? Yeah. How do they integrate new features and how do those sync up with industry trends? You know, if you read the Gartners and Foresters of the world, they obviously have an opinion on what tools should do. Well, ask your vendor when you read those those things and say, hey, how do you tackle this? You know, what are your plans on this? Yeah. And, you, you know, their, their product management would love to tell you that if they're good. <laughs> I agree. And then lastly, I would have a look at uh, how likely is that this vendor is there around in the future? Mm -hmm. Or how likely is it that as part of market consolidation, which will happen anyways in all markets, um, how likely is it that they will be acquired or acquire somebody else? Yeah, I can see that it being a huge issue if you have a vendor who has been recently acquired or is on the process of being acquired or is setting themselves up for acquisition. We all know what that looks like. The kind of support that you might get from them, well, that's not guaranteed. You're going to be at the mercy of the new company, the new owner of this product to either support it or de-support it from years to come. So it's it's always good to be investing in a stable partner in the technology vendor you go with. And that's that's really important as part of the evaluation. I also care a lot about, you know, is this vendor in my geography? 
Um, where are the development uh, services out of? Where where are my actual support services out of? Are they local to me? If I'm a, uh, working in a multinational, can the vendor that I'm working with support a multinational? I think a lot of vendors have different development shops in different parts of the world, um, but you know, 24 by 7, 365, global, that's a really important model for both support and also for helping to shepherd and provide services and strategic consulting and all those sorts of things. Can they do that around the world? Uh, where are they located? And then, of course, you know, magic quadrants, waves, matrices, all those sorts of market research reports. You can massage your placement in these analyst reports, but the truth of the matter is they're evaluating the quality of your products and they're evaluating the feedback from your users. And if you can find organizations with products listed in the top rates of those quadrants or the good parts of the waves or in the top of the matrix, those are really good starting points for conversation on evaluating platforms. I agree. And the next topic you might want to have a look at is what is the support that you have? And JM, you, you just mentioned it when we we're talking about development, mm -hmm. but think about your support. What happens if something goes south? You know, is it a commercial support? Does the vendor provide this? Or is it like in an open source project where you go and have a website and with a little bit of luck, somebody answers your question? Or on the other hand, how do you do the training? How do you get your people up to speed, the different roles? Does the vendor offer trainings? Do they offer free trainings, commercial trainings? How do they do this classroom versus virtual? Or do you have to go to your consultant of choice? Does your consultant of choice offer you uh, training for your end users? Mm -hmm. And lastly, I would have a look at the user community and the ecosystem. And let's start with the ecosystem, right? Those are typically partners or additional vendors when you have a mixed set of best of breed that have out of the box integrations and so on. Mm -hmm. How large is that? How big are the shops in that ecosystem? Is it like a 10 person shop or is it a hundred person shop? How likely will they react when you come to them with a request and how expensive will it be? Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, you have the question, is there a user community? What happens if you have a simple question? You know, all those quote unquote embarrassing things that you don't dare to ask. Well, everybody has those questions. So maybe there is a user community that has a portal, yeah. right? How many people are there? Have a look at this. How fast do they react on a question that you post there? Yeah. What is what is the information that you see there? Is it just a big cry fest? <laughs> like, oh, I can't make my tool work? Or is there uh, advice, valuable content, tips and tricks, videos, reusable material available for you, which obviously will accelerate your implementation? Yeah. And lastly, look at other user group meetings, virtual or in person on a regular basis. Are those user group meetings, if they're in person in your geography, if you're a multinational, are they across all geographies? Because nothing helps more to talk with other people who are in the same boat or ideally who are a step or two ahead of you and have gone through the valley of tears in implementing <laughs> the tools, right? And in implementing and creating the architecture artifacts learn from their war stories yeah and that would be part for me to say yep what is the support what is the ecosystem what is the user community where do i go when i need help yeah i feel like if you if you run into you know international user groups you can get so much insight on not only the product itself but also the vendor how does it treat its customers how can you work together with other users how is that facilitated um, and how can you learn from their you know, tough lessons learned, as you said, the valley of tears um, and come out the other side in a ray of sunshine. Uh, and that, 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 that'll lead me to a, a, another point that is really important here when you're thinking about this. And besides, besides all the tool features, you want to look once again at your people and you want to get acceptance in your organization. Um, so are you ready for this kind of platform, um, and and are you need to ask this tough question? Do you have things like executive sponsorship, or at very minimum, executive alignment? Um, have you built a clear value proposition for how a platform like this might be brought in? Um, do you have a, the plat for adoption? Do you have a business case? Have you socialized this? Have you gotten feedback and been able to incorporate that and buy in from key stakeholders? Um, and then thirdly, have you thought about change management? If today you're using 
whiteboards and sticky notes and nothing, you know, nothing digital at all. What's it going to take for you to move into a new way of working? And how are you going to develop those new practices? And what sort of people are you, do you have in place to help socialize that and get the learning development and guidance and handholding done within your organization to make this really stick? Um, and lastly, how does it align with your organization's roadmap and strategy? So as they're evolving, as they're looking to transform their business, what does having this do for them? So what is a platform like this, a drawing tool, a, a modeling tool, a database tool, what is that going to give them? What capabilities will that enable in them they wouldn't have had before? That's going to feed into everything else. And the closer alignment you have, the more friends you're going to make, the more allies you're going to make, and ultimately, the better deployment you're going to be able to get. And agreed. And this also brings to another more internal aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You should have an opinion on how to embed your tool into your current work. So not only aspirational, as you just said, JM, you know, mm -hmm. how does it fit in the roadmap, but how does it fit into the day to day work? How does it fit into your software development lifecycle? How does it fit in your current process improvement um, approaches? How does it fit into the state of your agile transformation and so on and so forth. So that is going back to the previous episode. Also one aspect, if you haven't done so, that you should put in your process governance work package when you implement your tool. Think about in which context will it be used and then you might see more things opening up, more opportunities where you say, oh, yeah, it would be helpful if we had this at a very early stage in our whatever software development process like budgeting for example or scoping out future projects or getting the idea for an improvement mm -hmm. thinking about the word budgeting the last thing i want to talk about here is that you know, i mentioned it briefly before but we do want to help make a business case for buying this professional tool um, and to do that, it's we, we think about it in six really simple buckets to put things in. So you can even write these down or we're going to talk about them more in a, in a companion at wantyourbaseline.com. But we want to see the value proposition for buying a tool to include the initiatives you're working on, what you're doing today, your current state, what you're going to be doing tomorrow. So what that future state is going to look like. What's your nirvana look like? Your obstacles, as in what's going to prevent that future state from coming to life. Uh, and that was the gaps that are created by the current technology solution you have in place, the current organization you have in place, the current people you have in place. And then what will this new platform enable? What's the enablers you are creating by introducing an architecture tool? And together, that gives you a strong value proposition. What am I going to change by bringing this in? And you can start to do things like put dollars and cents to when you think, take a look at measuring the amount of time you spend making process improvement initiatives come to life, the amount of time you spend maintaining an application architecture library, the time you spend reworking and reworking, reworking new deliverables every time because you don't have a database driven visualization tool for process. Uh, and together, that business case will give you a strong path to the future. So our call to action at the end of this section is to have you think about some things we've been talking about. And most importantly, what are your reasons for establishing an architecture discipline and supporting this by acquiring a tool? Why are you listening to this podcast? What matters about it to you? This particular episode, you're going to select an architecture tool. So why? We'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. And then we'll be right back with some thoughts and conclusions. <music> Hey, welcome back after the little break. And what we spoke about today was three things. What are the different type of tools you want to look at, the architecture tools? The second topic that we spoke about today was what are requirements 
for the different tools that you might want to choose. Remember, not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And then the last point that we spoke about was the non-functional requirements. How do you do the adoption in your organization? How's the vendor? How do we get support and all these type of things? What we did is we published two blog posts about how to select an architecture tool on whatsyourbaseline.com. So I hope that you didn't take notes while driving in your car, as always. <laughs> so you can go, and I will put the links in the show notes, uh, you can go to whatsyourbaseline.com and read all those criteria again. Uh, I will also put the list of things that you might want to think about purchasing to get personally ready uh, on the show notes as well. And... Uh, you will also find in that blog post series a nice little Google spreadsheet that helps you to accelerate your selection because it has all that criteria listed and you just can rate it there. Oh, yeah. Isn't, isn't that convenient? Hey, look at that, folks. You listen to a podcast and you get a free evaluation tool. <laughs> so in closing, thanks for listening to our podcast. As always, you can reach us at hello at whatsyourbaseline.com or I put a link in the show notes as well. You can leave us a voice message. So just click on the record message button and we're happy to bring your questions into a few episode and answer your feedback also please leave a rating and a review in your podcatcher of choice if you like the podcast that's great give us five stars if you want to give us <laughs> zero or one stars please don't rate us no Aww. i'm just kidding also give us the negative feedback so that we learn something and last but not least you find the show notes at what's your baseline.com slash episode four once again folks thanks so much for listening i've been jm erlinson and I'm Roland Volt. We'll see you in the next one.